All right, I'm back. Uh, chapter 7 left us, uh, let's see, um, Scout and started second grade, and someone had, and they found quite a few nice treasures, things that they really liked um, inside that knot hole, and then Mr. Nathan filled it up with cement and said that it was dying, but it wasn't. And that upset Jim very much that somebody had done that. Alright, chapter 8. For reasons unfathomable unfathom to the most experienced prophets in Macon County, autumn turned to winter that year. We had two weeks of the coldest weather since 1885, Atticus said. Mr. A Avery said it was written on the Rosetta Stone that when children disobeyed their parents, smoked cigarettes, and made war on each other, the seasons would change. Jem and I were burdened with the guilt of contributing to aberrations of nature, thereby causing unhappiness to our neighbors and discomfort to ourselves. Old Miss, Mrs. Radley died that winter, but her death caused hardly a ripple. The neighborhood seldom saw her, except when she watered her cannon. Jem and I decided that Boo had got her at last, but when Atticus returned from the Radley house, he said she died of natural causes to our disappointment. Okay. Ask him, Jim whispered. You ask him, you're the oldest. Well, that's why you ought to ask him. Atticus, I said. Did you see Mr. Arthur? Atticus looked sternly around his newspaper at me. I did not. Jim restrained me from further questions. He said Atticus was still touches about us and the Radleys, and it wouldn't do to push him any. Jim had a notion that Atticus thought our activities that night, last summer, were not solely confined to strip poker. Jim had no firm basis for his ideas. He said it was merely a twitch. Next morning I awoke, looked out the window, and nearly died of fright. My screams brought Atticus from his bathroom half-shaven. The world's ending, Atticus. Please do something. I dragged him to the window and pointed. No, it's not, he said. It's snowing. Jim asked Atticus would it keep up. Jim had never seen snow either, but he knew what it was. Atticus said he didn't know any more about snow than Jim did. I think, though, if it's watery like that, it'll turn to rain. The telephone rang, and Atticus left the breakfast table to answer it. That was you, LeMay, he said when he returned. I quote, as it has not snowed in Macon County since 1885, there will be no school today. Snow day! Eula May was Macon's leading telephone operator. She was entrusted with issuing public announcements, wedding invitations, setting off the fire siren, and giving first aid instructions when Doc Reynolds was away. When Atticus finally called us to order <clears throat> and bade us look at our plates instead of out the windows, Jim asked, How do you make a snowman? I have the slightest idea, said Atticus. I don't want you all to be disappointed, but I doubt if there will be enough snow for a snowball even. Calpurnia came in and said she thought it was sticking. When we ran to the backyard, it was covered with a feeble layer of soggy snow. We shouldn't walk about in it, said Jim. Look, every step you take's wasting it. I looked back at my mushy footprints. Jim said if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it all up for a snowman. I stuck out my tongue and caught a fat flake. It burned. Jim, it's hot! No, it ain't. It's just so cold it burns. Now, don't even scout. You're wasting it. Let it come down. But I want to walk in it. I know what. We can go walk over at Miss Maudie's. Jim hopped across the front yard. I followed in his tracks. When we were on the sidewalk in front of Miss Maudie's, Mr. Avery accosted us. He had a pink face and a big stomach below his belt. See what you've done, he said. Hasn't snowed and make them some sapomatics. As bad children like you makes the seasons change. I wondered if Mr. Avery knew how hopefully, hopefully we had watched last summer for him to repeat his performance <clears throat> and reflected that if this was our reward, there was something to say for Salmon. I did not wonder where Mr. Avery gathered his meteorological statistics. They came straight from the Rosetta Stone. Jam Finch, you Jam Finch? Miss Maud is calling you, Jam. You all stay in the middle of the yard. There's some thrift buried under the snow near the porch. Don't step on it. Yes, I'm called Jim. It's beautiful, ain't it, Miss Maudie? 
Beautiful my hind foot. If it freezes tonight, it'll carry off all my azaleas. Miss Maudie's old sun hat glistened with snow crystals. She was bending over some small bushes, wrapping them in burlap bags. Jim asked her what she was doing that for. I'm trying to keep them warm. So how can flowers keep warm? They don't circulate. I cannot answer that question, Jim Finch. All I know is if it freezes tonight, these plants will freeze. So you cover them up. Is that clear? Yes, Miss Maudie. What, sir? Well, could scout me and borrow some of your snow? Heaven's alive, take it all. There's no peach basket under the house. Haul it off in that. Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. Jim Finch, what are you going to do with my snow? You'll see, said Jim. And we transferred as much snow as we could from Miss Maudie's yard tires, a slushy operation. What are we going to do, Jim? I asked. You'll see, he said. Now get that basket and haul the snow you can. Haul all the snow you can rake up from the backyard to the front. Walk back in your tracks, though. Are we going to have a snow baby, Jim? Not a real sn No, a real snowman, now. Got to work hard now. Jim ran to the backyard, produced the garden hole, and began digging quickly behind the wood, wood pile, placing any worms he found to one side. He went in the house, returned with the laundry hamper, filled it with earth, and carried it to the front yard. When we had five baskets of earth and two baskets of snow, Jim said we were ready to begin. Don't you think this is kind of a mess, I asked. Well, it looks net missing now, but it won't later, he said. Jim scooped up an armful of dirt, patted it into a mound on which he added another load and another until he had constructed a torso. Jim, I ain't never heard of a nigger snowman, I said. Well, he won't be black long, he grunted. Jim procured some peach tree switches from the backyard, plated them, and bent them into bones to cover with dirt. He looks like Stephanie Crawford with her hands on her hips, I said, fat in the middle and little bitty arm. I'll make them bigger. Jim sloshed water over the mud man and added more dirt. He looked thoughtfully at it for a moment, and then he molded a big stomach below the figure's waistline. Jim glanced at me, his eyes twinkling. Mr. Avery sort of shaped like a snowman, ain't he? Jim scooped up some snow and began plastering it on. He permitted me to cover only the back, saving the public parts for himself. Gradually, Mr. Avery turned white. Using bits of wood for eyes and nose, mouth, and buttons, Jim succeeded in making Mr. Avery look cross. A stick of stove wood <clears throat> completed the picture. Jim stepped back and viewed his creation. It's lovely, Jim, I said. Looks almost like he talked to you. It is, ain't it, he said shyly. We could not wait for Atticus to come home for dinner, but called and said we had a big surprise for him. He seemed surprised when he saw most of the backyard and the front yard, but he said we'd done a Jim Dandy job. I didn't know how you were going to do it, he said to Jim, but from now on, I'll never worry about what will become of you, son. You'll always have an idea. Jim's ears reddened when Atticus compliment, but he looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned and then laughed. Son, I can't tell whether you're going to be a, an engineer, a lawyer, or a portrait painter. You per perpetrated a near libel here in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fella. Jim explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do, so long as you do something, said Atticus. You can't go and make, go around making caricatures of neighbors. Ain't a car caricature, said Jim. It looks just like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jim. He raced across the street, disappeared into Miss Maudie's backyard, and returned triumphant. He stuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed his, his, her hedge clippers into the crook of his arm. Atticus said that that would be fine. Miss Maudie opened her front door and came out on the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly she grinned. Jim Finch, she called you devil. You bring me back my hat, sir. Jim looked up at Atticus, who shook his head. She's just fussing. He said she's really impressed with your accomplishment. Jim looked up at Atticus, who shook his head. Oh, Atticus strolled over to Miss Maudie's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm-waving conversation. The only phrase of which I caught was, Erected an absolute morphodite in that yard. Atticus, she'll never raise them. 
The snow stopped in the afternoon. The temperature dropped, and by nightfall, Mr. Avery's direct predictions, direct predictions came true. Calpurnia kept every fireplace in the house blazing, but we were cold. When Atticus came home that evening, he said we were in for it, and asked Calpurnia if she wanted to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows and said she thought she'd be warmer at her own house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep, Atticus put more coal on the fire in my room. He said the thermometer registered 16, that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that our snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. Atticus was holding out my bathrobe and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jim was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tousled, and he was holding his overcoat close at the neck. His other hand was jammed into his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry, hon, said Atticus. Hurry and get your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No, it's a little after one. Hurry now. That something was wrong finally got through to me. What's the matter? By the end, he did not have to tell me just as the birds know where to go when it rains. I knew when there was trouble in our street. Soft taffeta-like sounds and muffled scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss? Whose is it? Oh, God, it's fire. Miss Maudie's home, said Atticus gently. At the front door, we saw a fire spearing from Miss Maudie's dining room windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the town fire siren welled up to the scale to a troubled pitch and remained there screaming. It's gone, ain't it, moaned Jan. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you, go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way, do you hear? See which way the wind's blowing? Oh, said Jim. Atticus reckon we ought to start moving the furniture out? Not yet, son. Do as I tell you. Run now. Take care of Scout, you hear? And don't let her out of your sight. With the push, Atticus started us toward the Radley front gate. We stood watching the street filled with men and cars while fire silently devoured Miss Maudie's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry, muttered Jim. Well, we saw why. The old fire truck, killed by the cold, was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached its hose to a hydrant, the hose burst and water shot up, tingling down on the pavement. Oh, Lord, Jim. Jim put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll let you know when. The men of Makeham, in all degrees of dress and undress, took furniture from Miss Maudie's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Maudie's heavy oak rocking chair and thought it sensible of him to save what she valued the most. Sometimes we heard shouts, and then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out of the window into the street and threw down furniture until men shouted, Come down from there, Dick. The stairs are going. Get out of there, Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he's stuck, breathed Jim. Oh, God. Mr. Avery was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jim's arm, and I didn't look again until Jim cried. He's got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his legs over the railing and was sliding down a pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Maudie's shrubbery. Suddenly I noticed that the men were backing away from Miss Maudie's house, moving down the street towards us. They were, they were no longer carrying any furniture. The fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against a vivid orange center. Jim, it looks like a pumpkin. Scout, look! Smoke was rolling off our house and Miss Rachel's house like fog off a river bank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the fire truck, truck from Abbotsville screamed around the corner and stopped in the front of our house. That book! I said, what, said Jim, that Tom Swift book, it ain't mine, it's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout, it ain't time to worry yet, said Jim, he pointed, look yonder. In a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his hands in his overcoat pockets. He might have been watching a football game, Miss Maudie was beside him. See there, he's not worried yet, said Jim, why ain't he on top of one of them houses? He's too old, he'd break his neck. 
Well, you think we ought to make him get our stuff out? Well, let's don't pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jim. <clears throat> the Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. The man on the roof pointed to places that needed it most. I watched our absolute morphodite go black and crumble. Miss Maudie's sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers. In the heat between one house, Miss, R Rich Miss Rachel's and Miss Maudie's, the men had long ago shed their coats and bathrobes. They worked in pajama tops and nightshirts stuffed into their pants. But I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jim tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not enough. I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders. My, by dancing a little, I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There was no hydrant for another hose, and the men tried to soak her house with hand extinguishers. Miss Maudie's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring the house collapsed, fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on top of the adjacent houses, beating out sparks and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before the men began to leave, first one by one and then in groups. They pushed the make-up fire, make fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck departed. The third one remained. We found out next day it had come from Clark's Ferry, 60 miles away. Jim and I slid across the street. Miss Maudie was staring at the smoking black hole in her yard, and Atticus shook his head to tell us she did not want to talk. He led us home, holding on to our shoulders to cross the icy street. He said Miss Maudie would stay with Miss Stephanie for the time being. Anybody want some hot chocolate, he said. I shuddered when Atticus started a fire in the kitchen stove. As we drank our cocoa, I noticed Atticus looking at me, first with curiosity and then with sternness. I thought I told you and Jim to stay put, he said. Why, we did. We stayed. Then whose blanket is that? Blanket? Yes, ma'am, a blanket. It isn't ours. I looked down and found myself clutching a brown woolen blanket I was wearing around my shoulders, squaw fashion. Atticus, I don't know, sir. I I turned to Jim for an answer, but Jim was even more bewildered than I. He said he didn't know how it got there. We did exactly as Atticus had told us. We stood down by the Radley gate, away from everybody, and when Jim moved an inch, Jim stopped. Mr. Nathan was at the fire, he babbled. I saw him. I saw him. He was tugging that mattress. Atticus, I swear. It's all right, son. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of Makem was out tonight in one way or another. Jim, there's some wrapping paper in the pantry, I think. Go get it and we'll... Atticus, no, sir. Jim seemed to have lost his mind. He began pouring out our secrets right and left in total disregard for my safety, if not for his own, omitting nothing, not whole pants and all. Mr. Nathan put seamen in that tree, Atticus, and he did it to stop us from finding things. He's crazy, I reckon, like they say, but Atticus, I swear to God, he ain't ever harmed us. He ain't ever hurt us. He could have cut my throat from ear to ear that night, but he tried to mend my pants instead. He ain't ever hurt us, Atticus. Atticus said, whoa, son, so gently that I was greatly heartened. It was obvious that he had not followed a word of Jim said for all Atticus said was. You're right. We better keep this and the blanket to ourselves. Some day, maybe some so scout can thank him for covering her up. Thank who, I asked. Boo Radley, you were so busy looking at the fire, you didn't know it when he put the blanket around you. My stomach turned to water, and I nearly threw up when Jim ha held out the blanket and crept toward me. He sneaked out of the house, turned around, sneaked up, and went like this. Atticus said dryly, do not let this inspire you to, to further glory, Jeremy. Jim scowled. I ain't going to do anything to him, but I watched the spark of fresh adventure leave his eyes. Just think, Scout, he said. If you'd just turned around, you'd have seen him. Calpurnia woke up at noon. Atticus had said we need not go to school that day. We learned nothing after no sleep. Calpurnia said for us to try and clean up the front yard. Miss Maudie's sun hat was suspended in a thin layer of ice, like a fly in amber, and we had to dig under the dirt for her hedge clippers. We found her in the backyard, gazing at her frozen charred azaleas. We're bringing back your things, Miss Maudie, said Jim. We're awful sorry. 
Miss Maudie looked around, and the shadow of her old grin crossed her face. I always wanted a smaller house, Jim. Gives me more yards. Just think, I'll have more room for my azaleas now. You ain't grieving, Miss Maudie, I asked, surprised. Attica said her house was nearly all she had. Grieving, child, why I hated that old cow barn. Thought of setting a fire to it a hundred times myself, except they'd lock me up. But, now don't you worry about me, Jean Louise Finch. There are ways of doing things that you don't know about. Why, I'll build me a little house and take me a couple rumors, and gracious, I'll have the finest yard in Alabama. Those bell and grass will look plain puny when I get started. Jim and I looked at each other. How'd it catch, Miss Monty? he asked. I don't know, Jim. Probably the flu in the kitchen. I kept a fire in there last night for my potted clam. Here you had some unexpected company last night, Miss Jean Louise. How'd you know? Oh, Atticus told me on his way to town this morning. Tell you the truth, I'd like to have been with you, and I've had sense enough to turn around, too. Miss Maudie puzzled me. With most of her possessions gone and her beloved yard of shambles, she still took a lively and cordial interest in Jem's and my affairs. She must have seen my perplexity. She said, only thing I worried about last night was all the danger and commotion it caused. This whole neighborhood could have gone up. Mr. Avery will be in bed for a week. He's right stove up. He's too old to do things like that, and I told him so. As soon as I can get my hands clean and when Stephanie Crawford's not looking, I'll make him a lane cake. That Stephanie's been after my recipe for years, and if she thinks I'll give it to her just because I'm staying with her, well, she's got another thing coming. I reflected that if Miss Maudie broke down and gave it to me, or gave it to her, Miss Stephanie couldn't follow it anyway. Miss Maudie had once let me see it. Among other things, the recipe calls for one large cup of sugar. It was a still day. The air was so cold and clear, we heard the courthouse clock quink, rattle and strain before it struck the hour. Miss Maudie's nose was a color I had never seen before, and I inquired about it. I've been out here since six o'clock, she said. She'd be frozen by now. She held up her hand. A network of tiny lines crisscrossed her palms, brown with dirt and dried blood. You've ruined them, said Jim. Why don't you get a colored man? There was no note of sacrifice in his voice when he added, Or scout me, and we can help you. Miss Maudie said, Thank you, sir, but you've got a job of your own over there. She pointed to our yard. You mean the Morphodite? I asked. Shoot, we can rake him up in a jiffy. Miss Maudie stared down at me, her lips moving silently. Suddenly she put her hands to her head and she whooped. And when we left her, she was still ch chuckling. Jim said he didn't know what was the matter with her. That was just Miss Maudie. That was a long one, 20.